welcome to Horizon. Uh, my name is Armen Sahakian, and I'll be your guest uh, host for this evening. And I'm actually joined by a very special guest, the founder, the president, and the executive director of Philos Project, Robert Nicholson. We'll be talking to him about his organization and the work they do, um, as well as about pluralism and religious freedom in the Middle East, as well as some of the very interesting youth-oriented programming that the Philos Project undertakes. So please stay tuned with us as we return back shortly with our conversation with Robert Nicholson. Welcome back, and we are here with Robert Nicholson, the founder, the president, and the executive director of Philos Project. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for having me, Armin. It's great to be here. Thank you for being here. So to start our conversation, because many of our viewers may not be familiar with Philos Project, can you tell us a little bit more about what motivated you, motivated you to start the organization and some of the mission and vision activities, mission and vision of the organization that you have? Sure. Uh, we founded the Philos Project in 2014, so we're almost five years old at this point, actually almost exactly five years old. And uh, the mission of the Philos Project is to promote positive Christian engagement in the Middle East. And uh, we started it in New York City. That's where we're based, and we're a nonprofit organization that is trying to uh, do education and advocacy around important issues of liberty and justice in the Middle East and trying to do it from a Christian perspective. That's wonderful. And you mentioned positive Christian engagement. Can you elaborate a little bit more as to what you mean by that? So obviously, when I say positive, I'm opposing it to negative. And I think in my mind, when I started Philos, mm -hmm. there was this idea that a lot of American engagement with the Middle East, with the communities that live in the region has been more or less negative. It certainly hasn't been all that constructive. And there's lots of reasons why that is. I think many Americans just don't have a connection to the region. They don't understand the issues that are happening. And, and what has been the result has been a lot of, uh, let's say, bad policy and certainly ignorance on the part of American Christians. So positive Christian engagement, um, for starters, is informed engagement. It's driven by a deep understanding of the region uh, the people who live in the region, and also, importantly, the connection between uh, us uh, Christians who live in the West and this part of the world, which is actually the birthplace of our Christian faith. And so bringing all of those things together uh, for us will lead to uh, positive engagement, not only within the American church, but also as people who come through our programs go into careers and in policy or politics or journalism or church ministry, they will bring that understanding uh, with them. That's wonderful. And to go back a little bit as to what might have motivated you, and you may have alluded that, uh, to that in your opening remarks, uh, did you find general ignorance in the American populace about their understanding of the Middle East and some of the issues that the Christians, especially in this part of the world, are facing? And that's kind of what prompted you to start this organization? 100%. It's exactly that. And I think really it stems from my own ignorance. So I... I'm a Christian. I came to Christianity much later in my life. I was baptized Catholic. I was actually born right here in Los Angeles, California. Um, moved and grew up in upstate New York and was Christian in sort of a general sense, but really had no interest in the religion um, until my early 20s when I had this kind of epiphany, and it's a long story, I'll spare you the details. <laughs> uh, but really it was when I understood that Ameri uh, Christianity was not, as I thought of it before, an American religion. Uh, and it wasn't even a European religion. It was actually an Eastern religion. It was a Middle Eastern religion. And this was right between 9-11 and the American invasion of Iraq. So the Middle East was everywhere. And I'm understanding that this Christian faith that I had been born with, is co it comes from this part of the region. And suddenly I'm wondering, what's the connection between the two? And I started to ask around, you know, what is, how should Christians be thinking about this part of the world? And what I got was a lot of uh, puzzled looks. People really hadn't thought about the Middle East in those terms. And if I went further um, and asked them, well, what do you think about the Christian communities that live in this part of the world? Just complete and utter ignorance. People aren't even aware that Christians live uh, in the Middle East in these various countries. And there are different Christian communities and all of these issues that are attached to them. And it's not because they don't care. They just, they've never been taught. And so a big part um, 
of what I do is really try to combat ignorance and try to do it not just by talking to people, but by providing experiences and relationships with that part of the world and the people who live in it that will drive a better, better advocacy. That's excellent. And uh, I think it's a certainly very commendable job that you do. And you alluded to the American Christian community, which, of course, is quite div diverse in and of itself. We have, uh, you know, evangelical Christians, Orthodox Christians, Catholics, and a whole array of other denominations and deriv derivations thereof. So um, is your target all of these communities, or did you start with one community and start, sort of grow out? What's the strategy and so, tactics behind? That's a great question. Um, we Officially, we want to reach all of these communities, and we're especially interested in people who are in leadership or who are moving into positions of leadership. Young professionals, people just out of college, beginning their careers, that is a, that, that is a group that we're especially interested in. Whether they're Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant, Evangelical, it makes no difference to us. Having said that, there are differences in the way that these communities engage or think about the Middle East. Um, many American Evangelicals, because they're very immersed in Bible, um, a book written by the Jewish people, uh, take some sort of special interest in the Jewish state in Israel. Um, American Catholics obviously are thinking uh, very carefully about the Catholics who live in the region, and there's different communities there, and they, these are the communities they hear about at church and they hear about um, from their bishops. Um, other communities, the Armenian community, uh, the Greek community, they're thinking about their own community as well. So one of the unique things that we do at the Philos Project, and it's, we'll see if we're successful, it's, it's very ambitious, is to try to bring all of these things together at once and have one big conversation and say, you know, let's back up. I understand you're evangelical and you're Catholic and you're Orthodox, but let's, let's try to think big picture. As Christians, after all, we do all believe in Jesus Christ. Let's try to find some commonality and to combine these issues in ways that makes us actually stronger. It makes our, our advocacy um, much more effective than it has been in the past. You know, united we stand, essentially. And so um, even though there are lots of differences, and in working with the communities, I have to be very aware of those differences, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is to create consensus. Excellent. And just to further clarify, because you said the Christian engagement in the Middle East, obviously there are Christians who are indigenous to this part of the world, but there are many other groups that are living there as well, the Sunni, the Shia, and other communities as well. And so does Philos Project undertake any programming with those other, say, non-Christian communities as well? So, yes, I think really the big word that we use a lot of the Philos Project is pluralism. And what is pluralism? There are many definitions of what pluralism is. But uh, really, when it comes down to it, pluralism is a belief that there can be more than one thing. It's plural, right? It's different than singular. Um, and I think one of the big problems in the Middle East is that some of the bad actors are very convinced that there's only one way to do things. There's only one way to believe, one way to live, one way to organize societies. And it's those actors, those organizations, those terrorists in many cases, who, you know, in trying to erase differences in the Middle East, are actually creating all of these genocidal situations that we're also concerned about. And so even though I myself am a Christian, um, and our organization is Christian, and most of the work that we do is with Christians, we're very, very intentional about trying to get out of that, trying to transcend those boundaries to make way for Muslims, different kinds of Muslims, Druze, Alawis, Jews, who, name it. Um, and to say that, look, there is enough uh, room in this part of the world for, for everyone to live. You know, there's, there's a need for mutual respect, but once you establish that, it's okay to have different ways to believe. We don't have to all be the same thing. Even if I believe there's one way as a Christian to, to believe in God, that doesn't mean that I have to make anyone else believe in that. In fact, it's actually impossible to make anyone believe anything, I would argue. Could not have said it any better myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and for our viewers, just as they are you know, listening to, I'm, I'm sure they are also wondering about your background, about your education experiences. So would you, sure. would you mind delving a little bit into that as well? So as I said, I was born here in LA, grew up in upstate New York in Buffalo, which is the opposite of LA. My parents were the only people who went from warm, sunny Southern California <laughs> to snowy uh, upstate New York. Uh, baptized Catholic, grew up early, my early days in a Catholic family. My mother became evangelical, let's say, when I was young. And so um, there was, there was a, com a combination of different influences religiously. 
Um, I grew up in a very simple home, uh, blue collar. My father was and is a maintenance man, uh, not necessarily intellectual, not very political. But I was always personally interested in religion and culture and the way that what people believe drove the way that they behaved. Um, and so I was always investigating and reading about other religions. Um, was always very sure that Christianity was the dumb one and the one that I didn't want anything to do with, at least when I was a teenager. Um, uh, but as I said before, as I got older, uh, that, that sort of uh, understanding, that recognition of Christianity and, and that attraction of Christianity ultimately led me to become a much more active Christian. And that really set off a chain reaction, not only in my spiritual life, but in my intellectual and social life as well. And what it, you know, having understood that Christianity is Middle Eastern um, and realizing that America is, for better or for worse, engaging with this part of the world, I set out on really some kind of spiritual intellectual journey. And um, really it started with me, because I'm reading um, Bible, I realized that I should probably read it in the original language because I was very dogmatic about that and began to study the Hebrew language in a local Jewish community, which led me to meet Jewish people. And I started to meet uh, people from Middle Eastern Christian communities. And sort of one thing led to another. Uh, it wasn't planned. I got a degree in Hebrew studies and in history. I got a law degree, a master's in Middle Eastern history. Uh, did a fellowship. Uh, before that, I didn't mention I was in the Marine Corps, served in the U.S. Marines and the air wing of the Marines. Um, and uh, one thing led to another, and my journey led me to this place where I've, I've been in a position to really lead on these issues. And sometimes I say that really the Philos Project is my attempt to impose my own journey on other people, <laughs> to try to help sure. other people understand this part of the world, why it matters so much, and what we can do to really make a difference there. Thank you, Robert. And please stay tuned with us. As we return, we'll be going deeper into some of the policy issues and political issues happening in the Middle East right now. Again, I'm joined by uh, Robert Nicholson from Philos Project. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Horizon. Uh, I'm here with Robert Nicholson, the president, the founder, and the executive director of Philos Project. So Robert, as we continue our conversation, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about the current political and policy frame that you're operating in the Middle East. Obviously, it's a loaded term, as we say. There is a lot happening as we speak. So what are some of the maybe top one, two, three priorities that the Philos Project is focusing on right now? That's, that's a great question. Uh, I think the first one is religious liberty, you call it pluralism, call it religious freedom, there's different names for it, but making sure that U.S. policy in the region is not only based on our security and material and strategic needs. Uh, most U.S. foreign policy, most foreign policies of every country are focused um, solely on kind of the realist assessment of the chessboard, right? We'll work with this group to offset that group, and that's all good, and in fact, it's, it's even important in a way, but what can't be lost in our foreign policy is the moral element. And I think that if you think about what needs to change in the Middle East, and this goes back to what we were saying about pluralism, really what, ne what needs to be fostered is freedom of conscience, is the ability to think what you want to think, to be able to act on those thoughts within the realm of law, and nowhere more importantly than in the realm of religion. This this um, suppression of religious feeling, the, the, the containment and the oppression of religious communities is rampant. And it's not new, it's been going on for centuries, but I think that it's important that the U.S., still being the most powerful and influential country in the world, is standing on the side of religious liberty. And I think that we've seen some, some great moves in that direction from the Trump administration. Um, we've seen some under Obama as well, and I think that those need to continue. So religious liberty as, as a big issue, I think, is number one. Uh, number two, we do a lot of work on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and right now, that conflict is, to put it nicely, deadlocked. Um, there is low confidence on both sides for peace. When you look at polling numbers for Israelis and for Palestinians, and you ask them questions about the likelihood of peace, of a two-state solution, both sides, because of all that's happened in the last 10 or 20 years, are very pessimistic. And so 
what we've been pushing, both through our own programming, but, but also when we um, go speak to um, uh, government officials in Washington, D.C., is to um, work more at the level of, let's say, people, and to think more about the principles that should guide a solution um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict than the, the paradigm, the one state, the two state. Uh, there needs to be um, a breakthrough. People, you need to, we need to get past the deadlock that we're in. It's a whole other topic, I won't go into it, but um, trying to find ways to, um, again, build consensus between Israelis and Palestinians um, around a shared set of interests is something that we focus very much on. Lastly, and this is related to the first point of religious freedom, um, is the, the situation of Christians in the Middle East. Now, we believe that everybody should have religious freedom, should have freedom, freedom of conscience, but Christians, as a very small minority, scattered, divided by denominations, divided by language, divided by national borders, they face a special situation. And I sometimes say, when people ask me, well, why do you want to single out Christians for sort of special attention? I say, first of all, it's not just Christians. There are other communities that have been um, faced uh, real difficulties in the last few years. But ISIS also paid special attention to Christians. And I think our attention needs to be just as special or even more than ISIS's. Um, and so trying to help Christians um, in these various countries, and each one of them is different. They have their own dynamics has been a big focus for the Philos Project. We actually were founded in 2014 at the height of the ISIS crisis. This was almost contemporaneous with the appearance of ISIS in our national media. Suddenly we heard the word ISIS and we're seeing these horrific images on television. And so there's almost something providential about the Philos Project um, in its link with the community. So I've traveled to Jordan a number of times, uh, to Iraq, to Lebanon, to meet with Christians who were pushed out of these areas. Um, in Iraq, in Syria, and who are now living in just terrible conditions in these other countries, trying to find ways to assist them, not only in just getting them out of the region, because that's what many Americans automatically look for, is, okay, let's just get them out of here and move them to, to Iowa. It's helping people who want to leave, leave, but also helping people who want to stay, to stay. And that's much harder, but I think that if we care about Christianity in the Middle East, the place where that religion was born, that we have to be thinking about solutions upstream in the countries where these problems originated. That's quite a tall order you have <laughs> as an organization, but certainly best of luck in that because that's a quite noble cause and one that speaks very closely to the hearts of the Armenians because for centuries we as a community have been persecuted for our faith, for the liberty and freedom to be able to practice that in uh, you know, no interference and violence. Um, because of it. And so thank you for all that you do. And that kind of brings me actually to my follow-up question, and you alluded, alluded to, it, to it in your uh, remarks, and that is the plight of the Yazidis and the Christians at the hands of ISIS um, or Daesh at the latest wave of genocide in that part of the world. Um, and as sort of co-incidentally, um, Philos project was co-founded or founded at that right, right at that period, what programming did you guys undertake or continue to undertake in um, resolving this issue and sort of bringing some attention and assistance to the people that have been affected by the genocide there? So it's, it is, it's a tall order and there's so much to do and it's such a difficult uh, task. There are other organizations that have raised humanitarian aid and have done a terrific job, much, much more than we could ever do at Philo since we're more focused on education and advocacy, but we have done some humanitarian aid. There's a, there's a small um, uh, village in northern Iraq that was largely built uh, with the dollars that we raised at, at the Philos Project for Assyrians, Syriacs, Chaldeans, who were displaced uh, by ISIS. We also support um, a, a woman activist. Uh, she's an Assyrian uh, born and raised in Iran, uh, had to flee that country after the revolution, but now dedicates her whole life to um, not only raising money for these communities, but advocating for them at the level of government and supporting her is very central to our mission. We've also brought uh, Western Christians on trips, essentially, um, you could say humanitarian trips, uh, especially to those who now live in Jordan, bringing aid, bringing a number of things, doing programming for uh, the children of these people who, who are living, you know, they don't know anything but living as refugees because they're so small. Um, and it's just, very sad, as you can imagine. 
Another thing that we try to do is to find young members of that community, people who are college age or a little bit older, and, all, and bring them into the Philos programming. You know, I was recently uh, at an event uh, that put on by the United Nations. Uh, this was when uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley was in charge for the U.S. delegation there. Uh, and the event was dedicated to the plight of Christians in the Middle East. And it was, it was a fine event. It was a terrific event. Um, and, of course, the administration gets credit for taking the time to put something like this on. But when I came into the room, there was uh, probably 50 to 75 people around this massive table. Um, and they were all weighing in on what they thought about the current uh, crisis for Christians and, and what needed to be done. And it struck me in a very visual way that the vast majority of these people did not belong to any Eastern Christian community. They were Americans who were Protestants or Catholics and who were interested um, but not connected. And I, and I had this sense walking out of that room that those rooms need to be filled with members of the communities who are affected, the Armenians, the Syriacs, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians. All of these people um, have the capacity to speak on their own behalf. And in fact, they can speak much more effectively. So, in thinking about the medium to long term, which is an area that we think a lot about at the Philos Project, I say if there's going to be a future for Christians in the Middle East, we need Christian leaders in the Middle East, people who know the languages, know the culture, know the national dynamics, to be standing up and speaking out on their behalf. So a lot of what we're trying to do at the Philos Project is to identify those young leaders, equip them, train them, and empower them to be advocates for their own community. I mean, you know, you're a, you're a living example. Uh, of you know, a, a community advocate who's speaking on behalf of the Armenian community in a way that only an Armenian can. And I think we need to duplicate that uh, across the board. Thank you, Robert. And please stay tuned as we return shortly to continue this very intriguing and interesting conversation. Welcome back to Horizon as I continue my conversation with the founder, president, and the executive director of Philos Project, Robert Nicholson. Robert, you have certainly done a lot of traveling in the region, I can imagine, and I've been following Philos Project for quite a number of years. And, you know, Armenians, as you would imagine, as the first Christian nation in the world, have quite a significant presence in this part of the world as well. And one of the current issues that face our community uh, is the Armenian quarter and the Armenian population in the old city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you have been there, you have seen that. Uh, what would be your observations as to the future of this ancient site and specifically the presence of these indigenous communities such as the Greeks, the Catholics, and the Armenians in the old city of Jerusalem? Yes, well, it is, a, it is an issue I've spent a fair amount of time on. I'm in Jerusalem almost once a month <laughs> these days. Um, and first of, first of all, let me say one thing about the Armenians, which is just interesting to me as somebody who works in this region. The Armenians are such a, I think, even of all of the Eastern Christian communities, such a unique community, um, both because of the way that they've developed historically, um, but also because of the way that they somehow managed to pop up in almost all of these different <laughs> issues. So, sure. you know, in the Middle East, there's issues with Turkey. There's issues with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There's issues with ISIS. There's, is there's issues, issues, issues. And somehow or other, there's always Armenians involved. And so I'm never surprised to find, whether I'm in Iraq or in Lebanon, in Borj Hamoud, or, and, and suddenly there's a whole, you know, a fully formed Armenian community uh, popping up in front of me. Uh, it's really one of the most, um, I think, one of the greatest examples of a community that despite, you know, really almost insurmountable odds has managed to survive and retain their culture in a way that I think is unique even among these different Eastern Christian communities. So I, I have deep love for the Armenians. And so this question for me is not just an abstract question. It's a, it's a question that means, um, it means something to me. So I, in, in the old city of Jerusalem, there is in fact an Armenian quarter. And what's interesting is that it's different from the Christian quarter, right? So mm -hmm. Armenians are Christian, but they've <laughs> managed to carve out their own space. And the Armenians, as you and, and many people know, have a really distinguished um, history, not a super long history, but a very distinguished history um, in Jerusalem uh, during the Ottoman period and, and since then. Um, I love the Armenian quarter. There's one Armenian restaurant that I love to go to, uh, one shop I often buy pottery at. But um, there is no doubt that there are some serious concerns that are happening right now on the part of not just the Armenians, but Christians in general. 
And I think uh, the, the, um, the plight of these Christians can be illustrated no better than in a, a short story. I was in the old city in the shop of a friend of mine. He's Syriac, Syriac Orthodox. And he, he owns like a gift shop. And I often bring groups uh, there to, to buy his products. And I, came, I was coming from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre late one night. And I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go by George's shop and see if he's there and just say hi to him. So I did, and he was there. He was sort of closing down, but he was happy to see me. He made tea. We sat down, and we started talking. And uh, interestingly, he told me in the course of this conversation that he w had moved recently from the Christian quarter to the Jewish quarter, of all things. And I thought, wow, that's strange. And he told me, well, it's safer and quieter. And, and I asked him, you know, are you planning to stay there? And he said, oh, no, no. I'm, I'm, my plan is to go to Canada. I'm getting out of here completely. And I said, George, wow, your family has been here for so long. You have a great business. Why would you want to leave? And he said, let me tell you, um, I have no place here. We Christians, we don't have a place in this conflict. To the Jews, I'm an Arab. And to the Arabs, and by, by that he really means the 99% of the Arabs who, who are Muslims, uh, he says, I'm a Christian. And so where is my place here? I'm caught between these two sides. They are at war, and, and what is my place in this? And so what's happening is, as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict remains in limbo, the Christian community is pressed ever more between the hammer and the anvil. And there have been a number of very specific, specific issues that have come up related to the Christian community, but also Christian properties, churches, um, the sale of those properties, the taxation of those properties. And this is an issue that I'm working very hard on. I'm actually leading a delegation of American Christian leaders, mainly Catholic, but not only, um, in two weeks to Jerusalem and to the Palestinian territories, focused specifically on this issue, trying to find ways that the American community can be helpful. And really, when it comes down to it, um, the story is this. There are issues on both sides of the Green Line. Christians in Israel under Israeli government have issues. Christians living in Palestine under the Palestinian Authority also have issues. Christians in Gaza, no one talks about them. I don't think there are any Armenians there, but there are Christians and they are in the worst state of all. And what needs to happen is really uh, diplomacy, religious diplomacy, um, track two kind of diplomacy between American leaders, especially American Christian leaders, and leaders in the Israeli government and also in the Palestinian government. Because these two governments are not thinking about Christian issues. They have all kinds of other issues on their plate. The Israelis are thinking about Iran and uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and all of these different things. The Palestinians are thinking about creating a state and uh, you know, finding funding, et cetera, et cetera. No one is thinking about the Christians, and it's up to us living in what is basically the Christian world to be reminding them on a regular basis that this is not an issue that you can just afford to ignore. This is an issue that we care about, and if you care about us, and if you care about our support for your two communities, you'll do right by these Christians. And so I think that a lot of the problem has just been ignorance. It's been um, a lack of priority. And so what we're trying to do at the Philos Project is to bump the issue for these Christians, Armenians included, from you know number 78 to number seven, number eight, number 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 two. You know we really want to get these in the in the faces of the people who make decisions. Great. And speaking of uh, forgotten uh, questions. Another one that we've been, of course, working on for quite a long time as a community has been the proper reaffirmation and condemnation of the Armenian Genocide. Yes. Of course, we've had quite significant progress, both here in the United States, having 49 out of 50 states officially recognize the genocide, and 12 out of those actually officially mandating the education in the public, public sphere, which is, which is excellent. But we're still quite a few ways away from the federal government, from reaffirming its own um, you know, role in saving the Armenians, the American people saving the Armenians 100 years ago through the Near East Relief, which is also based in New York, but in Syracuse, just a little ways away. Mm. Um, as well as, of course, the main target, and that being the government of Turkey, uh, which also has been, you know, on the, on the downward path, path of anti-democracy, civil rights um, uh, crackdowns, and generally just a crackdown on freedom of religion and faith in that country. And so from, from where you're sitting as, you know, advocate for all of sort of Christian issues in the Middle East, uh, where does the Armenian genocide, and generally the plight of the Christians in Turkey even today with the Halki seminary of the Greeks being, um, you know, not allowed to, to operate and whatnot. Where, where do these issues sit with Philos Project? Uh, very important issue. I think that you can't build a future if you don't acknowledge the past. 
And this is one of the areas uh, where I'm very critical of the United States administration, Republicans and Democrats, uh, for reasons of strategy, you know, playing the chessboard. They have chosen to, uh, they may say things here and there, acknowledging in different ways that something happened to the Armenians and the Assyrians and the Greeks, but they've always stopped short of actually affirming it, recognizing it, and not only recognizing, but making it a major issue. And I think that's been a major uh, moral failing on the part of successive American administrations. And I blame the current administration just as much as, as the previous ones. The Armenian genocide is key, not just because it's important to the Armenians or the Assyrians or the Greeks, but because it was a genocide. In, it was the first major genocide in modern times. I think it set the tone. Uh, no, you know, this is not me speaking. I've heard this many times. It set the tone for the Holocaust, which everyone remembers much more. And it set the tone, you could argue, for a lot of what's happening today in the Middle East. That same spirit of fanaticism, of erasing differences, of making everyone be one thing. It, it really, I think, started in modern history with uh, the Turkish genocide of the, of the Armenians. And so talking about that, recognizing it, affirming it, um, preaching it is, is, is a really important part of the Philos Project's DNA. We were involved, as you know, in, in helping in Iowa to get that state uh, to recognize the genocide. There's so much more to be done, um, and we're 100% committed, committed to doing it. And I think that uh, to the extent that the United States favors its, uh, what it perceives to be its strategic interests over its moral responsibilities, we're going to be uh, all the poorer for it. And it's unfortunate that you know, Turkey uh, lies at the end of lots of these roads. You know, it's, it's not only what's happening, happened to the Armenians in the past, it's what is happening, as you said, to the Christians in uh, Turkey today. Uh, the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Armenians, the, you know, all of what's happening under Erdogan is, is really just slipping under the radar and people are not talking about it and it astonishes me. Uh, what's happening in Cyprus? Nobody talks about that. Nobody even knows about that in the communities that I deal with. Um, also, you know, I talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Turkish funding of Hamas, major problem. You know, I was in, I was in Israel, there were rockets falling on my head, you know, thankfully most of them were being intercepted by a, an Israeli missile system, but sitting there, seeing these rockets coming in, realizing that these are the enemies of pluralism and religious freedom in the Middle East, the people who want to fight and kill other people, many of those people are being, if not directly, indirectly supported by Turkey. Turkey is a major problem in the region, and I lay uh, the strength of Turkey today really at the feet of the United States. We, of, I think of any country, have, have been the most, um, the most willing to turn a blind eye to a lot of what Turkey's done. Now, I don't think Turkey's beyond saving. I think there have been some things that have happened recently that may signal some change among the people, that they're themselves dissatisfied with what their government has done. But, so long as we just pretend as if there's no problem, uh, we're going to see a lot more problems. And it's going to affect the weakest uh, and the least powerful people, which really is the Christians uh, of that part of the region. You're absolutely right. Yeah, the crimes of the past go unpunished and they lead just for, towards more crimes in the future and into today. So thank you, Robert, and thank you for staying with us. We'll be right back after a short break. We continue our conversation with the founder, the president, and the executive director of Philos Project, Robert Nicholson. Robert, just to continue on this stream of uh, policy and politics discussion in the wider Middle East, of course, the other issue that is of grave concern and importance to the Armenians all over the world, but especially in the United States as well, is uh, the issue of Artsakh and uh, mm. self-determination and independence for the Republic of Artsakh and the citizens thereof. Of course, Azerbaijan and Turkey claiming each other as one nation, two states, and sort of continuing to this very day the genocidal policies and the policy of illegal blockades and trying to squeeze Armenia out and further sort of press on this indigenous population in the near, near East and the wider Middle East. And I like to call Armenia and Artsakh as the easternmost Western countries, basically the bastions <laughs> of Christianity mm. um, in this part of the world. So I'm sure you've come across the topic of Artsakh and the plight of its people. So um, 
I, I would like you to you know, share some of your thoughts on this sure. as well. Uh, now, it's, it's an issue I haven't spent as much time on. It's something I'm aware of, and I've, I've had lots of conversations about it. We, as the Felis Project, haven't really done any programming related to it. But, you know, I, I think my, my perspective is this. Artsakh is an indigenous Christian area. It should be free. I don't think there's any question about that. It, should, it has the right not only to exist, but to defend itself from those who would wish to destroy it. And we know who some of those people are. Um, and that those of us in the international community who are allowing Artsakh to be uh, surrounded, to be attacked, uh, to be undermined in various ways, uh, diplomatically, militarily, we need to understand what the issue is and we need to take steps to remedy it. And I think that there's a lot of ignorance about this issue, even among people I know who care about Christianity in this part of the world. Uh, when you say Artsakh, just blank stare. People don't know what that is. Um, and if they hear a little bit about it, they think, wow, it's too complicated. I, I don't think that's going to be an issue I'm going to be involved in. And they don't understand that really the issue is very simple. It's an issue of self-determination, of indigenous rights. And uh, the United States, uh, again, has really not been involved and we, need, we can do much more. And I don't think that you know, a lot of people, when I say on any issue that we need to do more, they automatically think, you know, the Iraq war, committing troops. Or, this is a, sort of a standard uh, American reaction after 2003. And what I say is there, there are a hundred steps between here and the invasion of the Middle East that we can do, some of them financial, um, some of them diplomatic. And we really aren't trying any of them at this point. Uh, even a few of them would make a big difference. And I think that there's really a lot that we can do to make sure that the people who live there, uh, the Christians of Artsakh, uh, can live safely, freely, and to live as Armenians, proudly and uh, without fear for, from their neighbors. Great. And as we sort of talk about the future and how we're going to get there, of course, uh, the topics of education, of capacity development, and empowering the youth and the new generation come to mind immediately because we would basically need all hands on deck or as many hands on deck as we possibly can get yes. uh, to get a lot of these complicated issues moving forward and pushing the needle forward one step at a time. And of course, Philos has been on the forefront of a lot of this work, educating and empowering the new generation of the leaders. And so for our viewers, I think it'd be very interesting for them to learn more about some of the programming that Philos Project does, specifically targeting the youth. And I know you have recently launched this very ambitious but excellent program that you kind of dub as the Christian birthright or the passages, yes. as you call. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start with that and then talk sure. about some of the other programs as well. Yeah. So really, you know, sometimes people ask me uh, what kind of advocacy we do at the Philos Project. And, and I say that we do a lot of the standard advocacy, but I'm much more interested in uh, training advocates than in doing advocacy, because long after I'm gone uh, and Philos is gone, these people, uh, having been trained, equipped, and given this this vision can go out in the world and, and do things that I'll never be able to do. And not just in the realm of policy and politics, but in journalism and all these different fields. And so a big part of what we do at the Philos Project is training young leaders. Um, you mentioned the biggest program that we've started. It's called Passages. Uh, Passages is uh, euphemistically the Christian birthright. This is the, the program that brings uh, Christians from all kinds of different denominations uh, from the United States on nine-day trips to the Holy Land uh, that are only $500. Now, it wow. seems too good to be true, but it is true, in fact, and I spent a lot of time fundraising to make up the difference, so I know for a fact that it's true. Uh, but these are people who they may identify as Catholic, they may identify as Protestant, they may identify as a fair number of them do as uh, Oriental Orthodox or, or, or Chalcedonian Orthodox, but people for whom the, uh, the Holy Land is meaningful. They want to they go there, they want to see what this place is, they want to understand how it's related to them. And so they go on these nine day trips and it, it's a mix of um, current issues, the issues that they hear about related to the conflict, and uh, you know, they go to the Syrian border and they look into Syria and talk about the Syrian civil war and Lebanon and all these different things. But a big part of it is, is spiritual. Um, and each group that comes um, really does passages in their own way. So if I have a bus of you know, members of the Assyrian Church of the East with their priest and their sort of leaders on board, their trip very much feels like a Church of the East trip, and the same would go for really any group. So what we're trying to do is just to create a platform for all of these different groups to come together around our shared 
um, Hebraic, Judeo-Christian, Western heritage, which really has its roots in this city of Jerusalem. And what I find is that, you know, I can go around talking about the Middle East, but for most people living in Southern California or anywhere, especially if you're not a member of a community that comes from there, it's, it might as well be, uh, you know, Narnia or, you know, some faraway land in make-believe. Um, but by bringing people there and immersing them in the culture, in the food, in the languages, suddenly this is a real place with real people, and I, I have a connection to it, religiously, spiritually, morally. And so, really, these trips are like a, an attempt to spark passion. And so then what do you do? You have, to, you have to channel the passion. You have to do something with these young leaders. And so we've created this whole system of alumni engagement, um, finding ways to make the trip just the beginning of a journey instead of the end and, and starting chapters and professional programming and all of this stuff to keep the conversation going. So that's Passages is a huge program. We have virtually no Armenians that go on Passages. So if there's anybody out there who's interested in, in going on this program, please uh, let me know. I'd love to have Ar an Armenian bus uh, every year. Um, in addition to that, we have a couple of programs that are a little bit more elite. We, these are for people who imagine themselves as having a professional career related to these issues. Uh, our Philos Leadership Institute, we do it twice a year. It's a two-week program, uh, not much more expensive than Passages, actually. We do Israel, Palestinian territories, and either Jordan or Egypt. And again, they get sort of a deep dive in the issues, it's spiritual programming, et cetera. We also bring current leaders, kind of like the VIPs, to, to understand different issues, like the trip that I'll be leading in, in a few weeks on the rights of Christians in the Holy Land. Um, and it, on the back end of that is, as I mentioned, this, this big Philos community, fed by these trips, fed by these experiences, but sustained by each other. Um, and really, at the, what we build are chapters. We build chapters in cities around North America. We have a chapter right here in Los Angeles. And the mission of the chapters is not only to gather as people who've heard, you know, had similar experiences and share similar interests, but to bring these messages to the wider community and to partner with local communities who, who share the vision, too. So, you know, our LA chapter, for example, I'll be uh, seeing them here in a few days, and one of the things that I'm going to be saying to them is we need to do much more with the Armenian community. They're right here. They're a huge community, and they're connected uh, to what we're doing in so many ways. Why aren't we doing joint events? Why aren't we educating our Western Christians on the issues that are facing uh, these people? So there is so much to do. Uh, we're not even close to, to, to doing it. Uh, but the future is in these young leaders. And if you're not taking time, you know, investing in them, giving them a platform, giving them resources to, to innovate, to be creative about advocacy, you're really going to be stuck in a box and, and the whole thing will die out in just a number of years. Well, uh, our time has run out, Robert, but I wish we had so much more because there are so many other topics we can discuss. Uh, but thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you'll be back again on our, on our show sometime soon to discuss some other issues. I'll just remind our viewers that my guest was the founder, the president, and the executive director of Philos Project, Robert Nicholson. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.